for today. Uh, we plan to hold these webinars weekly going forward, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, um, each lasting for one hour and probably at this time each week. Um, today we have two speakers um, as well as a panel uh, who, and the panel will engage with the speakers after each of the talks, asking questions and engaging in discussions. Our panel um, is Ivan Jaber, who's a critical care specialist at Kuriskia, Mark Mendelssohn, Sipa Lamini, and Sean Wasserman, ID specialist at Kuriskia, and Greg Caligara, a pulmonologist at, at Kuriskia. Um, as Wendy mentioned, uh, the audience can type questions in the, uh, the chat section. Um, I can't promise that we will be able to get through all of the questions. We'll try and uh, get through those questions where time allows. Um, and also feel free to uh, uh, sort of enter ideas that you have for future topics around COVID-19 that you would like us to cover in future webinars uh, in the chat section. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Marvin Hissal. Uh, Marvin is a virologist at UCT and Kuriskia Hospital. Uh, and Marvin's going to address uh, some of the key aspects regarding virological testing for SARS-CoV-2 uh, and then review a recent publication from Nature uh, that deals with the virological assessment of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So over to you, Marvin. Uh, Mark, um, can you put our slides? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks, Graham, for the introduction. Um, so while we wait for the slides to show up, um, so what I'll spend the next uh, 15 minutes um, doing is um, kind of start this uh, conversation around um, the, the, the diagnostic tests um, uh, for, for COVID-19. And the paper that we'll be presenting um, from um, a preprint version of a peer review paper in Nature will shed some light into um, you know, how um, we can interpret um, some, of, some of these laboratory findings which um, they will share in the paper. Can everyone hear me? I see that there's some message saying the audio is bad. Use the slides up. Mm -hmm. Marvin, your slides are up. All right, thank you. Um, so can we go to the next slide, please? So before I get into the paper, um, it's uh, good to just to kind of have a little bit of background. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about diagnosing um, viral infection in general, there are three broad categories of method that we use in viral, uh, virology laboratories. Uh, the first one is that uh, directly culturing the virus. And this is mostly historical as most of the diagnostic labs um, don't really do this anymore. They are quite time consuming. I mention it here because they, they will have this in the paper that I'm going to discuss. The second method is serology, and serology is obviously an indirect of identifying antibody towards um, the viral infection that we're looking for. And while this is kind of common for many viral infections that we are familiar with, um, in respiratory viruses, um, particularly acute um, viral infections, there are some challenging with, uh, challenges with its use. And thirdly, um, um, the, the nucleic acid test, or, or, or um, PCR, is actually the main way that we look for most um, respiratory viral infection currently. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so for, um, for 2019, um, we have these gold standard that we, we kind of consider um, the ideal condition that we use um, for, for, for sampling and testing uh, respiratory uh, viruses. We use dry flock swab sample with a plastic stem because they've been proven not to inhibit the PCR process. Ideally, we like to sample uh, uh, the, the back of nasal pharynx 
and, and oropharynx and, and have these two um, good samples um, combined placed in some viral transport medium and then have these uh, 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 viral transport medium transported to a laboratory um, while maintaining cold chain and 40, uh, 4 degrees and have them tested within 48 hours. Next slide, please. And then once it arrives at the laboratory, um, what we do is we have to extract and purify the nucleic acid. Next slide. Um, and then the purified nucleic acid then is tested by a real-time PCR for which we look for amplification um, of the viral genome. And next slide, please. Um, and all of this um, has a fairly rigorous uh, quality uh, control and quality assurance procedures with some of these things listed here. I'm not going to go through all them in detail right now. Um, and next slide, please. So, so with the background out of the way, let's get into um, um, the, the, the paper that I'm going to present. So this is coming from a German group headed by, by Roman Wolf. Um, and it's a study what I consider is like the, the old school uh, descriptive virology studies. And um, we don't see these um, studies uh, kind of too often, um, but it is necessary, you know, when we identify a new virus to kind of understanding the basic virology around um, some of the issues. Um, and in this particular study, there were only um, nine patients, and these are all mildly symptomatic individuals. And they are all part of a cluster that are identified at Munich. And they were hospitalized, um, presuming because of um, um, isolation issues, but it does provide a, a convenient environment for regular sampling to take place. So they basically characterized the viral infection in these nine individuals um, by the following. So they looked at viral and nucleic acid shedding. So they have um, multiple samples at various different time points from the onset of symptoms. And they do PCR um, in the sputum, in the swabs of these um, individuals. They also, from the samples collected, try to culture the virus, assessing uh, you know, whether they have viable virus detectable at all these different time intervals. They've taken blood sample from these individuals to look at antibody response, particular to the viral spike protein. Um, and they also collected stool and blood samples to see um, if they can identify um, the presence of virus in some of these other compartments. Okay, next slide, please. Um, it's a fairly short paper. So without further ado, let's just uh, look at what they found in the results. So basically, um, they found there are no discernible difference when they uh, compare the viral load or the detection rates in the nasal uh, pharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. So if one is um, forced to do just one, they are actually equivalent and you know, whichever that's easier to sample will probably do. Um, and if they look at all the swabs, you know, everything that they have taken between day five post uh, symptom onset, between day one and day five or post symptom onset, you know, the, the, the detection rate was 100%. And then if they look at anything that's taken after day five, and remember that they have a prolonged um, a sampling tail, um, the detecting rate then, then dropped down to around 40%. And then the last positive uh, PCR positive sample was taken on day 28 um, post onset. Okay. And they also looked at um, blood and urine samples. Um, and when they did PCR, none of those samples uh, uh, taken at various time points were positive. And interestingly, and this was also presented in some of the other papers I'm sure you're aware of, that stool um, at, were, were positive for PCR in at eight out of the nine patients um, in this case. Next slide, please. So to get into a little more detail, let's look at the viral load kinetics in the three different sample types. So in, in these, Kind of nine separate graphs, the one represent each of the individuals, and the three color line that you see um, represent um, orange is sputum, yellow is the swab samples, and then the gray represent the stool. And you can already see um, in general the sputum, the orange line, generally will have a better yield in terms of sampling, particularly at a later time interval compared to the swabs. Um, 
but the stool, interestingly, you see that there, there um, is um, detectable by PCR for quite a long period. Um, and the swab, obviously, a majority of the sample were um, pr provide good yield and reasonably high viral load earlier on. Um, and, and that obviously becomes, uh, the detection becomes more erratic, um, you know, as time goes by. And, ne and next slide. So what does that, what, what does this tell us? Um, so to me, it's really a, 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 a good news, bad news story. The good news is that um, the viral load is high early on, and, you know, particularly in, you, if we look at the sputum and the swab. And you know, if you sample during a symptomatic period, so the symptomatic period in these graphs is represented um, by, by the, 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 the pink and the purple horizontal lines um, in the top left. And you know, if you, particularly if you look in that period, I mean, the detection by PCR is very good. Um, next slide, please. But the bad news here really is twofold. So the first is that you know, the, the, the viral load kinetic shows that it, is, it has a decreasing trajectory which means that the later that you sample from these individuals, the harder it is to detect by PCR. And secondly, um, the, the day one sample are almost invariably the highest sample, which means that if you have, imagine they are pre-symptomatic um, samples, they are likely to have even higher viral load. And this from the outbreak point of view is bad news because then you actually well, more likely to be more infectious in the pre-symptomatic period. Next slide, please. Right, so the, the, the next step obviously to identify, so which of these um, positive nucleic acid represent live virus? Because that's an important question. This is when um, live virus are being shed and able to infect individuals. And there are two ways of looking at it. The first way is to actually compare with um, the amount of uh, viral load that they detect and then this that you can see that generally, um, you know, we are able to culture the, those that were the higher viral load samples. And if you look at the dots here, it's still the same kind of color coding. The orange sample represents sputum. So one is more likely to culture from the lower respiratory tract than the, higher, uh, the, than, than the, the upper respiratory tract. Um, and then you can see from the gray dots that there were no virus that were cultured from stool. Um, and, and this could be a, mean a number of things, but um, you know, culturing virus from stool is always a, a challenging prospect. So, so it could just be a te technique issue. The next slide, please. Um, another way of actually try to look at this is and you know look at the proportion of positives, um, you know, in relation to the, the the day of onset of symptoms. And if you plot it in a graph. Um, and then the dotted line here, um, so, so, so the solid line is a trend line. So we're looking at graph F on the left hand side. Um, dotted graph, uh, at the dotted line represent the 95% confidence intervals. That you will see around about day 10 is where the, the proportion of culture result um, becomes negative. Next slide. And this obviously also correlates to, um, as I mentioned before, um, the, the level uh, of virus, the, the higher the level of virus, the more likely one is to culture, um, um, be culture positive. Next slide, please. And if one take into account um, the, the, the blood sample or the serology result, now another interesting phenomenon start to emerge that saw around about day eight, this is where you get almost majority of patients that would have several converted and then we have detectable IgG and IgMs. And it's quite likely that these antibodies um, have a role to play in terms of the negative cultures um, from the day eight onwards, um, at least from the limited um, number of individuals in this study. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So all of this taken together, if I have to summarize, I mean, so a picture starting to emerge. And this is where, um, you know, our, our current diagnostic challenges come in. So they're, they're likely, there are two scenarios. So they are the upper respiratory tract, which is kind of one compartment, and then the lower respiratory tract, which is another compartment. Obviously, we know that the ACE2 um, receptor, which the virus uses, is of relatively low abundance at the upper respiratory tract. And there you have, I, active viral replication likely to happen very early on. And then when one takes swab, 
um, one can get a reasonably good yield in the first five days. And then after that, it becomes erratic, um, you know, with the study detecting up to about day 20 in some of the individuals from the upper respiratory tract. In the lower respiratory tract, however, um, the yield um, is much better um, and probably because there are more abundance of the ACE2 inhibitor, therefore the higher viral load are being shed and higher viable virus are being shed. And they are kind of persistently high in some cases. Um, and they were able to detect viral RNA up to 28 days in the lower respiratory tract. Um, and, but despite this, the culture positive only until day eight. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned before, what it means is that the peak infectiousness is likely precedes the symptoms. And this is a big issue around the control of the outbreak. Um, and a lack, lack of the culturable virus from day on that coincides with the, uh, the serial uh, conversion. And this is a kind of interesting thing that we probably need to be looked into further. We've seen that other study indicate that there are high level of mucosal IgA. Um, and uh, whether this um, is neutralizing, we don't know but it could affect the sensitivity of the culture. Um, and to look at the true active viral shedding, it's probably somewhere between um, eight to 20 days. Um, and as more antibody are being produced, presumably the infectivity started to decrease from day eight onwards. And then finally, you know, the, the, the stool PCR that is positive, what does it mean exactly? We still don't know. Um, but I've seen in some publication, they are starting to use um, environmental sampling as a, a mean of surveillance, particularly in the sewage water. So we have to wait and see in this um, area. Next slide, please. And next slide again. So, so back to the whole um, diagnostic issue. So the one question I get asked repeatedly is, you know, what is the sensitivity of the COVID-19 PCR? So I can say from the analytical sensitivity point of view, um, we can detect to around 100 copies um, per swab suspension. So this is when we conduct control experiments in a laboratory. This is what the assay can do fairly reliably. But in the real life setting, what does this actually mean? And remember this um, kind of chain of events that we want to um, have um, to, to get our best yield. Next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, we are starting to compromise on several of those steps. So first of all, um, Swabs is a actually scarce commodity these days. Um, and we're starting to use cotton swabs instead of um, synthetic materials. We're using swabs with wooden stem, which we know that can somewhat inhibit the PCRs. But despite this, we are managing to get PCR positive in a lot of these samples. CDC is starting to recommend a nasal and, and, and mid-turbinate samples um, as opposed to proper nasal pharyngeal samples. Um, and you know, instead of viral transfer medium, which we have run out, we are starting to receive just dry swab and testing them. And we are putting them in saline and sometimes saline is being added at the, 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 the point of care. And they are being transported to the lab, sometimes at room temperature. And we are not exactly um, kind of keeping to our turnaround time all the time. So these can all um, compromise the sensitivity of the test in some way. And finally, um, next slide. So just a look at you know, some of the quality assurance and quality control things. I mean, it's happening so fast. So it's really difficult to maintain some of these things. Very few assays are actually CE marked or FDA approved. Um, and we do, we do a reasonable validation, but it's not as thorough as they would like. And you know, definitely not the same way that we would do them um, last year for other respiratory viruses. Our process changes every second and third day. So a standard operating procedure is very difficult right now. And we've ordered external quality assurance panel, but the first one will likely arrive only in June, which is not going to help us in the first few months of testing. And next slide. And finally, you know, we're looking at all sorts of method of extraction. Um, some might not even involve fancy equipment by simply just heating sample and adding them to PCR. Um, so finally, so what does that mean um, for the sensitivity of PCR? Um, I think that will make an interesting discussion and um, I think I'll end my talk here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marvin. Um, Graham, do you want to be the panel?
Okay, sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. Thanks. Thanks very much, Marvin, for that, that summary of the paper uh, and very clear presentation. Um, so I'm going to uh, direct the first question at you and then uh, ask the panel to each uh, ask one question. And I see there is a question from Jeff um, in, in the uh, uh, text box that we'll, we'll get to once we've had a round of questions. Um, so Marvin, I was just interested, obviously it's a study of only nine patients, but the level of uh, RNA in the uh, sputum was uh, uh, quite um, high relative to the swab samples. And do you think there's any uh, reason for us to consider sending sputum samples um, in addition to the swab samples uh, in order to improve sensitivity? Would that, obviously it has, has resource implications, but I'm interested in your thoughts around the, the, the sputum yield. So yes, um, I think we kind of constantly in discussion with the various different um, kind of people who are interested in sampling about what is the ideal sample type and what is a reasonable sample type. Um, and in my opinion, um, in someone with a productive cough, and if and when we can do it safely, as you can see from the study, sputum might actually be the preferred sample. So, so in places where people can do it safely um, and not in these crowded um, clinic rooms and et cetera. I mean, I, I think it is a good idea and we can definitely process them in the laboratory. So, so that is just what to bear in mind. And, and this has to be a proper sputum sample, not the, these kind of salivary um, and, and, and diluted sample. Okay. So, so that's the short answer. Okay, thanks Marvin. You know, I just want to uh, preface that by saying that any change in, in uh, sampling methodology, we would obviously take the lead from the NRCD. So at the moment, uh, you know, the, the guidance is to do uh, nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs and we'll stick to that. But I really raise that question as something to consider going yeah. forward. Um, so I, I just want to, I think Sean had a question uh, regarding the paper. John? Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, thanks, Marvin, and hi, everyone. Um, so, so, Marvin, I've got a question about the concept of viral replication. So, as opposed to just detection of viral RNA and culturing the virus, like they did in the study, there was also a small section which you didn't address where they tried to quantify um, viral replication using a viral subgenomic messenger RNA or sgRNA ratios. Um, and I think, I mean, this is quite important because it potentially has implications for direct antiviral therapy, which although it acts by different mechanisms, viral replication seems to be an important kind of component of that. Um, so uh, in the study, it looked like they detected or well, they demonstrated viral replication up to about day five in swabs and up to day nine in sputum. So I have two questions for you. Firstly, just to kind of explain this this technique of viral subgenomic messenger RNA for understanding viral replication. And then also, what do you think the therapeutic implications of this finding are? Sorry, I was muted for, for a second there. Um, yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, so, so the, the first part of the question, so, so the, 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 the sub, subgenomic, um, I said, so the way, the way it works is that, you know, in, in a situation where there, there are active viral replication, there are various um, different parts of the, um, the viral genome that is being transcribed. So when, when you look at the, um, the, the the subgenomic components, you will start seeing that they are, are more the different types instead of just the, sing, the, the, the single copy. So if you look at the subgenomic component in terms of total component, you can probably starting to um, to estimate how, how active the, those different genomic components are in relation to the, 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 the actual total copy numbers. Um, I personally haven't worked with this technique, so obviously they will have some limitations of exactly how to interpret them. And in the paper, I think they, they, they have they are a very short section and they're kind of using it cautiously to give, give it as an indication that they think based on this, it's, uh, um, you know, it, it, it suggests that, you know, there, there, there's limited viral replication only to the first few days. 
um, and how how we actually roll this sort of things out, I guess um, will be quite difficult. I mean, the, the main implication, um, you know, we obviously don't have drugs yet and depends on how the drugs will work. Um, may need to be um, done in a more specific research setting, whether, and you know, using this method or, or, or some other method. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't comment on that right now. But I, I think it is important to think about the whole issue of our replication um, in terms of uh, particularly, you know, if you have healthcare workers and, and you know, when we're thinking about the de-isolation um, and settings, you know, what, what can we safely um, do, you know, like at what stage can we allow, you know, people to be, you know, going back to where they were doing it and reintegrated with um, the, the places of their, you know, work and other, you know, social settings. Thanks, Marvin. Um, I think, uh, Greg, did you have a question? I did, I did. Yeah. Um, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. Um, so I just wanted to say that I thought that the generalizability of this data uh, to our current inpatient service is obviously quite limited as all the patients have mild disease. And in fact, if they, they mentioned the two patients that um, had some pulmonary involvement, they don't specify what that is, had high peak sputum viral loads around day 10 or 11. Um, do you think that the excretion kinetics will be different in patients with severe pulmonary disease? I mean, we can expect them to shed more virus and remain more infectious for longer. And um, is there a role, do you think, for quantification of viral load at diagnosis as a prognostic marker? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think that, that, that that's a difficult question. And I think obviously, um, you know, uh, a more kind of um, in-depth characterization of the, the in-hospital setting will be required. I think so far I've seen, I think that, that, that there are a couple of papers that looks at the kind of hospital patient, but, but none of them have kind of done individual descriptive things that, 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 that in, in, in this you know, particular fashion. So for the time being, I want to say speculatively that, you know, we can perhaps extend what we find in this study and, and, and try to think about, you know, whether, um, whether, whether you know, at least in the short term, there will be any value of, of monitoring them. Because, you know, in the asymptomatic individual, if you look in their sputum, you know, they, they remain high for, for a couple of weeks um, um, from mm -hmm. the respirate, lower respiratory samples. Um, and there are quite a lot of individual variability from patient to patient. So it's not like a standard thing that one can use. So I, I think if I have to make an educated guess, I think at the early stage, it may be difficult to use, for example, uh, you know, a tracheal or aspirate viral load to kind of predict, um, you know, how well the patient is doing. Um, but yeah, we need, we need more data. We need more study like this to actually understand what's going on in the severely ill patients. Yeah. I mean, I think it does show the, as Sean pointed out, like the fact that uh, viral shedding and, and infectivity might, might not go completely together. Yep. Okay, so um, unless one of the panel members has a brief question, um, I think, uh, okay, so Ivan, if, if you can ask the last question and after that we will move on to the next talk. Um, and I will ask, uh, seeing we've run out of time, I'm going to ask um, Marvin if he will reply directly to Jeff uh, in in the in the chat room um, uh, during Frederick's talk. So Ivan, yeah. So so Marvin, really quick question, um, and it's just listening to your talk and my reading. The reality is the sensitivity of, of PCR based testing on nasopharyngeal swab specimens is in fact not that good. And you know, just to uh, what I would like your comment on is 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 you know, what do we tell clinicians who are dealing with patients who are phenotypically sick and they end up with a, with a negative swab result? What would you suggest they should do then? Um, yeah, no, I think um, the, 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 the issue 
I have with all diagnostic tests, I'll try to keep this brief. The, the, the issue I have with diagnostic tests is that the context of which um, the test is done is very important. And when we interpret result, that clinical context has to be taken into the equation. So in other words, if you have a high index of suspicion, and then the result that you get does not match what you have, um, you know, then, then we need th those results needs to be questioned. And then we're actually functioning at a time where, you know, everything is suboptimal. So, so, you know, although I would like to say that, you know, the, the paper and some of the data that, that are shown of sampling upper respiratory tract is um, surprisingly good. I mean, the, the real life scenario is that this is not going to be for every single patient. So, so I think individual um, interpretation, you know, I still need to caution that, you know, you know, the, the clinical picture needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and obviously, you know, in a situation where, um, where it needs to be done, um, you know, and some individual may need to be isolated anyway. Okay, thanks Ivan. And, and thanks very much again, Marvin. Uh, really appreciated your input. So we want to move on to the next uh, speaker, our second speaker, who's uh, Frederick Tienemann. Uh, Frederick is a specialist consultant at the University Hospital Zurich um, and is also an honorary associate professor in our department at UCT, having worked and uh, done research in Cape Town for eight years previously. Um, and so Frederick's department has managed uh, over 150 patients with COVID-19 over the last month. Uh, and he's going to be presenting two illustrative case uh, studies of patients that they've managed um, and just giving us a brief overview of some of the clinical experience, uh, sharing experience that will be relevant to us here in our clinical practice in South Africa. So over to you, Frederick. Thanks, Graham, and good afternoon, everybody. And greetings from Zurich. Um, maybe you can just give a, a last uh, comment um, on the question with uh, regards to, to you know, CT values we can do to actually monitor patients um, who improve or who deteriorate. We have been looking at this and this has been looking quite promising that over the time um, sampling the CT values actually increase in those patients. And then we had a couple of patients who, who had CT suspicion, ground loss opacity that we found was, was, was COVID disease. And we just did repeat um, cultures of the sputum and the and nasopharyngeal swabs and we eventually found it in all of them. Uh, we sent stool as well and we never got a positive PCR from the stool. But coming, coming to my talk, I'll give you a brief overview um, of the situation in Zurich. And just to the next slide, please. So the agenda is a quick epidemiology of, uh, of COVID disease in Switzerland, and then the two cases, and, and then a summary and discussion points. Next slide, please. So the first COVID patient was admitted on the 28th of February in Zurich. Uh, we have two isolation wards that are run by the medical and the ID team. Um, when I returned end of February from Cape Town to Switzerland, I didn't expect to fall into an infectious disease epidemic in Switzerland. Um, but we had a steep learning curve uh, with many patients, as Graham mentioned, 150 now. So what happened further on then at the beginning of March, um, all elective surgeries were stopped, uh, the OPDs were closed, uh, and uh, for those patients who do not necessarily require it, and we switched over to phone consultations. The hospital was closed for visitors. We had security checks at the entrance. Um, we have medical students that you can see on the picture on the right-hand side who are distributing masks to the, to the people coming in. Um, and then theaters and post-anesthesia care units were turned into ICU and uh, we ramped up the ICU capacity with ventilating facilities to 150 beds. And then since the beginning of April, we now have a um, mandatory face mask for everybody entering the hospital. This is all staff and all patients who still have to go to the outpatient departments and uh, every patient admitted gets a uh, SARS-CoV. PCR. Next slide, please. You can see the entrance that is closed. It's separating now staff from patients. And then on the right hand side is the emergency department, which has now three tents in the front. And everybody with um, flu like symptoms is screened for COVID disease before entering the hospital if the patient does not need to go to the red zone, which means he needs to be treated urgently. Next slide, please. 
down the road, just 100 meters from the university or hospital, there is a, a gym. Um, and this gym was changed into a emergency hospital. They built it up in the last two weeks. You can see a picture on the right hand side with small uh, cabins that were built up. Um, and you can see the basketball um, net on top of it. Next slide, please. Um, we have lockdown now for three weeks. That means everything is closed in Switzerland, but we can still um, go into the parks and go running, but we're not allowed together with more than five people. Um, you can see that uh, the epidemic uh, took off on the 15th of March. And today we have 2,185 people admitted. This is the yellow curve on top. You can see it's flattening and actually we have 140 patients less than three days ago. So uh, we are not having many new admissions and we are discharging patients. And this is the same for the, for the graph, for the red graph at the bottom. This is number of patients admitted to ICU. In total, we have 400 patients and this has been stable. We haven't been admitting patients to ICU over the last two days in Switzerland. And we have 266 people currently ventilated in Switzerland. Next slide, please. These are the stats from yesterday. So in total, we have 21,000 um, cases. On the bottom right, you can see the distribution by age. And uh, so we have cases between 20 and plus 80, a pretty normal distribution. Next, next slide, please. Of the people who died, so we have a low mortality rate similar to Germany. Um, the median age of those ones who died at 82 years now. We only have three deaths who are between 30 and 39, one death between 40 and 49, and very few below the age of 60. And then it's steady climbing, peaking in the 80s. Next slide, please. Which brings me to the first patient. It is a 69-year-old woman who presented with a three-day history of dry cough, headache, progressive dyspnea. She has no relevant medical history. Her husband is unfortunately admitted um, and tubed in our ICU here with COVID-19 disease. Um, vitals on admission, that was on the 25th of March. The heart rate was pretty normal, 63. Blood pressure was okay. She was paroxysmal with a temperature of almost 39. She was brought in here by um, the ambulance. She had an initial um, oxygen saturation of 78, which then increased to 86 with six liter face mask. On a clinical exam, she was obese and weak. GCS was 17, she was oriented. Cardiac exam was normal. She had bilateral fine crackles over the lower lung fields and the abdomen and renal and so on. Exam was normal. On the right hand side, you can see the chest X-ray it was done um, in the emergency department, bilateral um, infiltrates. Next slide, please. The tear blood gas that was done in the emergency department showed a VO2 of 14.9. pH was 7.45. She was breathing pretty hard. On the right hand side is the normal blood count and the only thing that we see in all COVID patients is the lymphopenia. I think it has been well described in viral infections. Next slide, please. This is the chemistry of the patient. In most patients, we see slightly elevated LFTs. She had a CRP of 30, um, which is in, in keeping of a viral pneumonia. We did a SARS-PCR that was positive. We did serial blood cultures on her, which did not show any growth and the ECG was normal. Next slide, please. She underwent uncontrasted CT scanning and we can see bilateral ground glass opacities with starting consolidations across all lung fields. Next slide, please. So what could we offer her? We offered her hydroxychloroquine. We all know the data from, um, from the group from Marseille, which was not very convincing. Nonetheless, we started her on 800 milligrams stats and then 200 milligrams BD for four days to receive a total of five days of hydroxychloroquine. 
we started here on calf dioxone and low molecular heparin for TBD prevention and she went to the normal ward with an oxygen face mask with four liters. Next slide, please. Now we are purely digital in the hospital and this is the way we monitored the patients. You can see the first red arrow sees the respiration rate, which is um, in our opinion, the most important monitoring for the patient. So we have four times per day, the nurses measure the respiration rate. Then below you have the pulse, the heart rate, despite um, the severe illness remains fairly low. Most patients below 100. The body temperature, the patients remain perexal for many years, for many days, and some patients up to 10 days. Doesn't go higher than 39, but persistent at this level. Um, and this is despite four grams of paracetamol that she receives. Um, and uh, she had a SpO2 of 90 with four liter oxygen. Next slide, please. We looked for comorbidities. We did an ABA1C and we found uh, 6.5. So she has a diabetes or prediabetes. Um, an interesting marker that we discovered um, and we did it systematically in all the patients is using R6. Um, and this patient, um, she shot up, she deteriorated on um, the 26th of March, which is four days into her illness. And her inter IL-6 uh, shot up to 109 from 46. And from our feeling, and it's just feeling and experience, um, we thought that she is at risk um, of moving into ICU. We offered her an R6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, which she refused because she was very afraid to experiencing um, um, adverse events with previous drugs. So she refused to, do, um, to go into this experimental arm. Next slide, please. And then on day six, her temperature is still at 38. The respiration rate shot up. And again, this is one of the most valuable monitoring markers from a respiration rate of in the low 20s before up to 40. And she required oxygen demand went up from four liters to eight liters. And it was a deterioration that we experienced over several hours. So it's a rapid deterioration. Next slide, please. So she underwent CT scanning again. We were looking for a CTPA. We didn't expect that the chest was getting that bad. The D-dimers only came back later um, after she came out of the, out of the CT scan. D-dimers were low at 0 0.77, but she had massive progression of her infiltrates bilaterally, including all lung nodes, uh, uh, lobes. And you can see on the top right, you can see the previous images, the same slides. Next slide, please. So we completed in this patient the hydroxychloroquine two days ago. We completed the keftaroxone. We actually stopped after five days, after all the blood cultures were negative. She was only receiving heparin and oxygen. So what could we offer her? We contacted ICU. Um, ICU told us, you know, try to, try to postpone it as long as possible. Um, and then we enrolled her. Um, we are one of the trial sites of, uh, trial sites of the Gilead uh, remdesivir trial. Um, which uh, offers remdesivir, the antiviral drug, to all patients with severe disease. And uh, they're randomized into a arm, which is five days, and an arm, which is 10 days. Next slide, please. So remdesivir is one of the most promising um, drugs um, at the moment. And this patient improved rapidly. You can see her IL-6, which was 111 on the 31st of March with the small red arrow. And then she improved um, within a few days. And yesterday had an R6 of 14 and 20. Um, and she's now with an oxygen saturation of 96 with a nasal cannula with two liters. Um, we are swapping the patient regularly. And the reason is because we want to de-isolate them and put them onto the normal wards just to, just to empty out our isolation wards. Um, but it's, uh, it's an up and down, it's a positive and negative and positive and negative. And we're currently looking at the CT values and the CT values are going down. 
the negative swaps that we have in between, we think, and, but I mean, we just discussed this um, a few minutes ago, this can be a sampling or is most likely a sampling error, but they occur more frequently as the CT values go down. Next slide, please. So in summary, we have a 69 year old healthy woman with a pre-diabetes. She had a moderate RDS. We cultured every specimen that we could get. We did not find any bacterial superinfection. She did not have evidence of pulmonary embolism. She was deteriorating despite hydroxychloroquine and antibiotic cover requiring high O2 concentrations. And she improved rapidly after 24 hours after starting remdesivir. She remains PCR positive after 15 days of onset. And this is certainly different from the nine patients from Munich with mild disease, this is severe disease, ARDS. So we want to de-isolate her and uh, we um, will put her into pulmonary rehabilitation. Next slide, please. The second patient is a 70-year-old man with a three-day history of nasal congestion, chills, productive cough, and dyspnea. His medical history is mainly cardiovascular. He has 20 pack years of smoking, he has a hypertension, which is fully controlled at the moment, and he is obese. He was diagnosed with COVID disease two days ago by his GP. His vital signs on the 21st of March, heart rate was 100, blood pressure was high, but uh, that was equivalent to what we heard from the GP. Temperature again, um, just close to the 39. Saturation um, by the ambulance was 88, and that increased with just two liters to 96. On exam, obese and weak, was oriented, cardiac exam was normal, especially no signs of heart failure. The chest, um, was chest auscultation was normal, the abdomen and renal exam was normal as well. On the right hand side, um, we see a chest x ray. And we suspected there might be a small infiltrate in the right upper lobe. Next slide, please. The panel that is done in the emergency department of all patients admitted, um, which are medical, is a troponin. This patient had a troponin of 80 and an NGPRO BNP of 833. Patient has cardiovascular risk factors. And so we did a ECG on this patient. Next slide, please. So the ECG shows a sinus rhythm, heart rate is 93. We have a left anterior fascicular block. We have no R progression. We have one single negative D in AVL and in a prolonged QT time. Next slide, please. We repeated four hours later the troponin. This patient does not have chest pain, and the troponin went from 80 to 191. Otherwise, the exam is normal, especially the kidney function is normal. The patient does not have this mild elevated LFTs that we see in many other patients. Next slide, please. So he went into the cath lab. Um, you can see the left coronary artery and there was no evidence of coronary artery disease um, despite the troponin and the cardiovascular risk factors. Um, on the next day, we um, of course read the cases from China and we put the patient into the MRI. In the MRI, we suspected a myocarditis, which is associated to COVID-19. The patient had an LVH, um, the LA was mildly dilated. There was no ischemic pattern, which we saw in the cath lab already. There was the typical late guadalinum enhancement and there was no relevant pericarditis. So the patient um, uh, qualified for acute myocarditis according to the Lake Lewis criteria. Next slide, please. Back to the ward. On day three, that is the 24th, this is now six days into the patient's symptoms. Um, the patient deteriorated um, again within, within hours, um, high oxygen demand. This was the moment where the IL-6 on the previous day went from 66 to 101. 
you can see the CRP was actually dropping from 233 to the day when he deteriorated on 185. We underwent CT scanning again with this patient and you can see that his chest uh, worsened. We only have the chest X-ray as comparison from baseline, which was more or less normal. But again, in, in viral myocarditis, it's questionable how well um, a chest X-ray, if a chest X-ray is useful. And again, in this patient, we see these ground glass opacities. We have beginning consolidation. We have a very often a pronounced pattern that the consolidation starts subpleural and that all lobes and all lung fields are affected. Next slide, please. We couldn't keep the patient um, on the ward, and the reason why I'm showing this, this patient was actually admitted to ICU on the 26th, and on the same day he was tubed, he was mechanical ventilated, he underwent bronchoscopy, the bowel showed no bacteria, they actually looked for mycobacteria as well, um, and no fungals, there was no evidence of PCP, the patient did not require inotropes, and he could be weaned and extubated three days later. And this is much different from the reports that we have from China. We have extubated um, of, uh, of the 40 patients that we had in ICU. We had two patients who died and about um, one third of them could be extubated by now. Um, the patient was then referred back to the clinical ward, um, to the general ward, and he proved clinically. And today he is, again, as the other patient on two liter nasal cannula and SpO2 is 96 today. And again, here we did the serial swaps and they're not helpful. Um, but again, here we have to look at the CT values. Next slide, please. So in summary, we have a 79 year old healthy man with cardiovascular risk factors. He had acute myocarditis confirmed by, uh, by CMR that presented as an end STEMI. He deteriorated with high O2 um, demands. Again, the marker here was increased respiration rate and he was admitted to ICU with severe ARDS and he could be extubated after three days already. We did not have evidence of superinfection. Interesting that his procalcitonin was actually quite high. He was only ventilated for three days, as I said, and he had good clinical improvement since and he remains PCR positive 16 days now after sy symptom onset. Again, he will also move to rehabilitation soon. Next slide, please. So in summary, and these could also be the discussion points, we have a cohort in Switzerland of people 40 to 80 years. Comorbidities are common in those without comorbidities. We actually look for diabetes, and we have found it in most. Even in young patients, um, we had um, HbA1cs that were going up to 8.8. Um, the imaging chest x-ray, especially in mild cases of viral pneumonia, is not helpful. Um, patients suspected with low respiratory tract infections had the typical patterns on the CT scan. Um, we actually had three patients who had the COVID typical patterns with ground glass opacities, progression to consolidation, often these pleural bands, which I, which I mentioned before. And we, in those three, we did not find um, um, COVID disease. Um, we had initially a very low threshold to do CTPAs. We did not find a single patient with a pulmonary embolism, and we only had one out of 40 uh, in ICU who had, and this one had a severe pulmonary embolism. So we now changed the threshold uh, to do a CTPA to a D-dimer above one milligram per liter. And uh, we commonly see mediastinal and hyalur lymph nodes that increase in size and number, but not enough to qualify for lymphadenopathy. R6 seems to be a good predictor of worse outcome, mechanical ventilation. That's what I'm meaning with this. And that we will look systematically at the 150 patients once they complete the 28-day follow-up. Troponin may be elevated in elderly patients with best suspected myocarditis. It's interesting that we do routine troponins, and we haven't seen raised troponins in the younger cohorts. LFTs are mildly elevated in almost all patients, and none of the patients develop renal um, impairment, and most of them even have a renal function um, in ICU. 
all blood cultures were without growth. So we have to discuss the relevance of bacterial superinfection and antibiotic cover. And then we have off-label therapies um, as within trials and outside trials, we're giving hydroxychloroquine, um, we were giving Caletra initially, which we stopped after the NHNM paper came out. We've been giving trocalizumab, so R6 inhibitor without great success, and, uh, and we're including at the moment most patients in the remdesivir study, which seems to work very well. Um, and then PCR remains positive for up for three weeks, so we need to have a pragmatic, pragmatic de-isolation strategy in order to send the patients to rehabilitation. And that's it from my side. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you so much. We had a very steep learning curve over the four, last four weeks and open for questions. Thanks very much, Frederick. Uh, I think that was really great to hear your overview of that clinical experience. And I think there's, there's a lot of learning points in there for us in South Africa uh, about what to expect uh, the clinical presentations and clinical course in these patients. So I want to ask uh, Mark Mendelssohn um, if you want to fire the first question at, at Frederick. Thanks very much, Frederick. It was um, great to hear these, these two cases and uh, well done for everything you guys are doing. Um, and your, you know, your stats are, are speaking for themselves. So amazing. I mean, the, the, the big, big unanswered question is the reason for rapid deterioration uh, in patients who are going to require critical care. And it really does seem to happen very, very quickly. And you, you've highlighted myocarditis as one issue. I I'm interest, was interested and surprised actually that your thromboembolic disease uh, was not greater because um, that's uh, uh, one thing that a lot of people are concerned could be un underlying this. And I just wanted to ask you about the other possibility of fluid balance, or in fact fluid disequilibrium, and whether you think that might um, play any role in sudden deteriorations um, in these patients. So I'd be interested to know what you think about the cause behind sudden deterioration in, in the patients you're seeing. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark, for the question. So, as you said, you know, they, they really deteriorate rapidly over, over a course of very few hours and they shoot up with the respiration rate. Um, we, we did monitor the BNPs in most patients and most patients did not have any history of heart failure and, and we did fluid restrictions um, initially, especially in those patients who had a severe X-ray um, or, or a CT scan at the beginning. So we were always trying to keep them on the very, very dry side um, and, uh, and it doesn't seem to, to, to matter. I mean, the predictive for, for deterioration is really the IL-6 and H. Um, this is, you know, this is not systematic again. This is, uh, this is the experience that we have. Um, and I don't know why it happens between day seven and ten, day 10. You know, once the patient has passed day 10, we are very, very, you know, positive that you know, and we can reassure the patient that he actually, you know, is, is, is on the safe side. But, but until then, um, um, it can happen, um, you know, usually at this, at this late course. So the patients have, it's, so it's biphasic. The patients come to the casualty department at the first phase when they deteriorate. They realize a dyspneic shortness of breath um, and, then, and then deteriorate a week later um, while they are admitted. Um, and interestingly, that those patients who we do not admit who also have shortness of breath, um, they, we, we hardly have any readmissions of those ones that we send home from the casualty department. But again, your question is, you know, we, we keep them very dry. We don't think that this is a reason. And we did troponins and all of them. And those ones who deteriorate like the first case had a normal troponin. I don't know. Um, I'm going to ask Sipa if, if he's got a question for Frederick. You can unmute Sipa. Hi, hi. Thanks, Frederick, and uh, thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, I think um, I had two questions for you, and one quick question. You just kind of brushed through the your experience with IL-6 inhibitors. It seems like the first lady, you were, you, your group was quite keen to offer her that. Can you just um, uh, uh, explain to us um, 
why you've had a negative experience? Is it because of the kinds of patients you've, you've been sort of selecting to use? Because it looks like it's a good marker for, 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 for identifying who's going to have a worse outcome. And then my second question is just related to, in the 150 patients in your hospital, have you had any HIV positive patients? And uh, can you comment on how HIV infected individuals uh, have sort of fed or uh, presented? Is it just those with very low CD4 counts with poor viral loads, or is it just mostly uh, those with uh, 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 good viral control and, and high CD4 counts? Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Ipo. So um, the IL-6, we, we did the IL-6 systematically at the beginning of the epidemic, because this was data that, that, that we had from China. So we, we, we did it consecutively on all the patients, and we actually do it daily. Um, and we, we always saw that, you know, it, it coincided with clinical deterioration. Um, and then obviously, you know, came into play that we can, that we can try a Tembra. So it's, it's an experimental drug in COVID disease. It's, and, uh, and we did it in, with four patients and all four patients ended up in ICU. So we didn't have, um, you know, we just stopped it. And then the second question is immunosuppressed patients. We do not have any, um, it, we have a large HIV clinic in Zurich and you know the, the HIV cohort in, in Switzerland is it's very well described. They have been warned um, by, the, by the national services to, to be very careful and stay at home earlier than the general population. So we haven't admitted a single HIV patient um, with COVID disease, but we admitted many patients with transplant um, that were that developed, uh, they were infected with, um, with SARS-CoV-2. And interestingly, that all those ones who are transplant and immunosuppression, all of them did not develop a severe AODS. I have admitted another two um, after, after a renal transplant uh, several years ago today, and we did CT scans in both um, to look for, to look for uh, pulmonary infiltrates, and both of them have a normal um, CT scan. And that is that is and that is now a spectrum of about twenty patients um, where we you know we admitted them for at the, at the beginning for three days, you know just to catch them early in case they deteriorate. But they did not deteriorate. We did not have any transplant patients except one, who actually had to go to ICU. But again, you know these are very small numbers, um, but uh, but we are reassuring our transplant patients that they're actually pretty safe uh, despite immunosuppression. And we talk about tacrolimus, celcept, um, and prednisone, 20 milligrams or even higher. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Frederick, we, we've just gone past the hour and uh, we wanted to keep this to one hour. Um, I, if I can just ask you for a one sentence response to Kluti van Vieren's question about uh, the infections among healthcare workers in Switzerland, what has been the experience? So, we have 36 patients who, um, 36 healthcare workers at our hospital were infected, but we have a, a very broadly um, epidemic here and we don't know where they got infected. On the COVID wards, the two wards that we have, we do not have a single healthcare worker who got infected and we are using normal masks, not N95. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for sharing that experience uh, with us, Frederick. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we would have liked to have more time for questions and discussion. Uh, but we did really want to limit this to one hour, and I think it's been a very valuable hour, your input and, and Marvin's input and the, the questions from the panel and engagement. So thanks to everybody. Uh, and just to say that we will be having a, another session uh, this time next week. Um, an advert will be sent out, um, and we're planning to have an engagement uh, a presentation from a colleague, an infectious disease colleague who's been working in Spain, uh, who will share his, his clinical experiences. Um, as well as, uh, similarly to today, a review of a recent article uh, on the clinical aspects of COVID-19. So thanks to everybody, uh, and we'll uh, hopefully be joined by everybody again next week this time. Thanks. Ray, much. thank you very much. It's Mark Sundrop here. Just to wrap up, uh, on behalf of my co-facilitator, Wendy Spearman, and yourself as Chair, Graham, and to the panelists, Mark Mendelssohn, Ivan Ubeir, Seaford Lamini, Greg Hedegaro, Sean Wasserman, we want to thank our two speakers, uh, Frederick and Marvin, very much. Uh, we just want to finish off by saying that uh, the session has been recorded and we will save the chat function as well with questions uh, for Graham's purposes so that uh, 
further sessions can be designed around uh, actual questions. We will be putting out exactly where one can find this recorded session. We'll probably put it in a Dropbox or uh, on a Google Drive, and we will be informing people how it can access that. So thank you very much, and thank you for your time, and uh, thank you again to everybody who has participated. Have a good day.